G'day guys, Chris Dorey here. Today I'm going to go through my July 2021 AFL Draft Power Rankings and I'm going to expand it for the purposes of this video out to 40. So on ESPN earlier in the week I published my top 20, but I thought for my YouTube community is something special I would add an extra 20 names to that just to get some more names out there. Um, and I'm also going to separate them into their various tiers just to sh sort of show I guess where they really fit in my opinion at least in regards to all the others. And I'm also going to go through my concerns regarding Victoria's talent this year and why I've got some concerns for the future as to, I guess, the calibre and strength of the Victorian prospects will be, I guess, developing and seeing come through over the coming years. So let's get started. So to start us off with my July 2021 power rankings and tier list. So... As we can see with each of these markers, it basically indicates a new tier. So, um, so I've got a pretty clear-cut top three, so Dacos, Horn and Darcy. So Dacos to me has been the best performed to date this year and I'd be comfortable taking a pick one ultimately. So I think he's really that lowest risk prospect and the one with certainly for me at least the highest floor. So um, I'd be very comfortable picking him. Um, from there, Jason Horn, he's that next sort of highest floor prospect from there. And again, as with Dacos, I think they're both going to be really good midfielders ultimately. But um, a lot of people, have, and there's a lot of vocal Horn fans out there, so he definitely is in that pick one conversation, but for me, I'm sticking with Dacos at this point. Um, pick three, Sam Darcy. For me, he's got the highest ceiling in this whole pool. So as a 204 centimetre basically key forward and look he can play key back and ruck as well um, but seeing what he did in that um, practice game um, was just incredible so the six goals three behinds just every time the ball went to him he made something happen and seeing the combination of not only strong overhead but the ground level craft really that instinctive play and finishing at ground level around the ground just really impressive so um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing more of Darcy and um, yeah, if he has more games like that he could well contend for pick one or two on my draft board. So, And keep in mind, this being power rankings, this isn't a prediction of where I think players will go. Instead, this is where I rate them in the draft and if I was picking, I guess, the level of priority I would assign to picking each given player. So just for that context as well as that disclaimer. But Darcy being that late developer as well, um, that's hugely appealing to me. So still developing physically, but seeing, or I guess hearing where he was previously, he's not someone I'd seen prior to this year, but hearing where he was previously, um, and understanding, I guess, how that progression has gone, going from a 197 last year to now a 204 centimeter and still growing as far as I'm aware. Well, yeah, he could be an absolute monster and really, I guess, a unique player and something we haven't really seen at that height because he could well get to, and this is just speculation, but what if he's a 206 centimetre key forward? Well, we haven't seen someone with his sort of mobility, agility, ground level craft at that height before. So um, he could absolutely be a special player. And as a result, if he's going to have more really high end games, um, and if he keeps working on that work rate endurance then, um, yeah, I'm absolutely willing to consider him for number one or two in, on my draft board. So, But for this stage, just playing it safe, playing it conservative, he's number three. And I think most would agree there at this point. Uh, Matthew Roberts, for me, he, I would imagine he's probably relatively unique to my board this high and in a tier list above this next group, I would be suggesting. Um, and look, I'm just really high confidence on him. Having seen what he's done in the um, SA under-18s, um, watching his Sandful League debut, um, he just looks like a really good piece. So um, one of the highest floor prospects in the draft. His floor is pretty similar, I would almost say, to a horn. And just seeing both what he can do, midfield forward, he's got the contested ball winning, best sort of ground ball winner, cleanest I've seen below the knees in this draft. Maybe a Conor McDonald might be in that conversation with him, but just that one-touch player. But great skills, really damaging left foot. So, um, yeah, look, he's someone where he can be a really good piece. So um, I would, with confidence, if this top three are off the board, I'd be very comfortable taking Roberts, and I'd be pretty comfortable knowing I haven't messed up. So 
that would be how I'd be feeling there at least. Um, Josh Rochelle, he can play both forward and mid on the weekend, six goals, so he's a very talented forward. Um, best foot skills in the draft, and he can also go through the mid first possession winner, so um, really like him. And Although most would probably have him maybe closer to 10, I would be imagining, than 5. Um, he's just one where I'm higher confidence on a Rochelle than I am with others, so... Um, that's just my feeling at this stage. Um, ben Hobbs. So he's one where he's moved up my board. Um, coming, coming into the year and what I was imagining based on what I saw early on before he had those weeks off, I was really sort of thinking with him, oh, he's just a contested bull, strong tackler. I, I wasn't necessarily thinking there'd be more to his game. But um, seeing a couple of his games recently where he's gone two goals, two goals finding it will around the ground, it, there's a bit more to his game than what I was thinking. Um, not overly athletic, so I think that does cap him a bit, but um, yeah, look, nonetheless, he's one where he's a ready-made midfielder, so for those fantasy types out there, Ben Hobbs is a name to certainly be circling. Um, but yeah, high production, really good mid, so, um, but he can also go forward, reads it well, strong marks, so there's a few options there with him, but I think he'd be drafted as a mid and used as a mid. I would imagine even from season one, depending on where he gets drafted. So, um, one to watch and probably one of few of those immediate types. And of course, with a Roberts, a Horn, a Dacos, you're looking at immediate players there too. So, um, Rochelle, maybe not as immediate, though I do think we probably do see him year one. Um, Finn Callahan. So he's, uh, for me, he's a high risk, high reward. I'm not as confident as I am with the top six. I'll say that outright. So with a Callahan, look, his movement is absolutely remarkable. From the first game I saw him, I, I was outright on Twitter saying, hey, for a 190 centimetre guy, this is the best movement I've seen in terms of that agility, evasion, acceleration, all in combination. It's like when I was watching a young Jack McRae at the same age, but even possibly turned up a notch. So, um, yeah, he's got really incredible movement for that height. So that's what he's got on his side. He's got some class, can take a mark. He's got a bit of an inside-outside balance, though. For me, he's someone where he's very reliant at stoppages on receiving, and that's something that really worries me with the Finn Callahan. So, um, and there's been occasions in... One recent game in particular where he just hasn't gone hard enough, whether it's to win his own ball, to tackle, he just really needed to be more aggressive. So um, seeing that passivity, I don't feel as comfortable as others would because I've, I've heard that others have him top five on their boards. But for me, based on, I guess, what's lacking, I just can't justify that because ultimately at AFL level, if you're going to be that mid, you still do need that level of hardness, that aggression, those ball-winning capabilities, and he can win some of his own ball to his credit, but I'd like to see that ramped up and that aggression ramped up to feel comfortable really moving him into the 4-5 territory, maybe even nearing 3, as I've heard some are even sort of touting him at this point, so um, that might be a bit of a point of difference on my board. Um, Josh Sin takes on the game really well with his speed, but I want to see more from him and more ways he impacts games, more production. Um, he's one where maybe if others rise, he could be at risk of dropping, but it's just, it's this is an annoying draft where it's just no one in any of these tiers is quite on the level you'd want. Where with the top three, I'm not seeing any sort of generational types. Maybe a Darcy based on his upside could be a nearing generational key forward if things really work out, um, but yeah, with a Nick Dacos, maybe you're looking at a Zach Merritt, a Horn. You're probably looking at just below that. Um, different style of game, of course. So maybe it's like a midfield version of an Isaac Heaney. So again, you're not necessarily looking at the generational plays in this draft. And with these tiers, you're going to have misses. So um, in the first round, I think there's going to be a lot of misses this year. I don't think recruiters are going to get it all right. Because ultimately, there is a real reduction in quality, particularly from Victoria, as I'll go through in some stats I'll go through a bit later. Um, Tyler Sonzi, he's one where I've been actually quite disappointed with him. Um, he had that great game for Box Hill in the VFL, but he's had other games where he's just been 
quiet and you haven't noticed him at all and you, I, I can't justify that from an early pick and even having him at nine he's someone where and I've moved him down from I think he was three or four in the prior month but I've really had to move him down quite dramatically just because I can't rely on him doing it every week so um, that's a problem for me and then the next four so um, these four would be I would imagine unique to my board this early on um, at least I haven't seen anyone or heard anyone rating him this high so um, if you do let me know in the comment section below or if you've seen someone rate him that high um, but Connor McDonald so I've been impressed with him in every game I've seen this year so um, in terms of that one touch ground level player as I mentioned before he's that absolute one touch ground level player high volume contested ball winner racks it up around the ground um, so I'm really liking his game he can go forward hit the scoreboard um, so he's, he gives you a lot of options there so um, and again he might be one I'm tempted and with further good games and a bit more refinement he could be moving up into this five maybe six territories, so um, yeah, really watch out for him. It's really just as long as he starts lowering his eyes, hitting more short targets, and bombing long to contest less, I would be very comfortable moving up to maybe even as high as five. So um, do watch out for that. Um, Josh Ward. So um, at number 11, um, I completed my power rankings actually before I watched the game of him on the weekend, but watching the game of him on the weekend... Gee, I would be tempted even to move him up possibly as high as 6. So, um, yeah, watch for that move in my um, August power rankings next month. Because um, seeing his last three games, he's been an absolute ripper. So, firstly going head-to-head -head with Dacos, breaking even in that game, then dominating in the, um, the trial game for the champs, and then, again, last week, again, dominating with way over 30 disposals. And... You've got not only the ball winning components, but he's using it so well. So, um, yeah, he's one where he really needs to be regarded really highly, and he's one of the better mids this year. Um, if I was to adjust this board now, again, I'd be probably, again, moving him ahead of a Hobbs. So, um, but I'm just, for the purposes of now, just keeping it consistent with what I've got on ESPN in my July power rankings there, with my top 20, of course. Um, currently available with full strengths and weaknesses if you want to read through all that um, but the next one Yuland he's as far as I'm aware a completely unique player to my board I haven't heard anyone talking about him as someone they would take even as high as the first half of the draft but um, seeing um, two of I, I think even because it's two of his Nabley games I think he's only just played the two um, but in those games he's been phenomenal so um, he's the most aggressive player I've seen in the draft in terms of his attack on the ball, tackling. He breaks tackles like a maniac. So you've got all those components to him. He's got acceleration, so he's a good athlete. Um, he's capable aerially, but then his kicking as well, beautiful. So um, if I see a third game and he lights it up like he has in the games he's, I've seen of him already, he might join Ward in being in this sort of five, six, maybe seven territories. So... Um, I'm really liking the look of Yuland, and um, yeah, I just and he's been playing VFL in recent weeks as well. So um, for VFL watchers, um, if you see him named, check him out and let me know what you think. Um, and same with the NAB League watchers, let me know what you think because he's one where I haven't heard anyone else talk about him, but it's just every time I watch him, he's an absolute gun. So. Um, yeah, I'm well behind him, and I'd be bidding a first-round pick on him pretty comfortably and feel very confident in doing so. And if Gold Coast weren't to match, well, I would be absolutely stoked. Um, so we'll have to see if those concessions for Gold Coast are taken away this year with regards to whether they can just take their academy players, add them to their list, or whether they actually have to go through the draft process. So, um, yeah, we'll have to see there. Um, Hugh Jackson. So um, he's been absolutely dominant in the um, SA under-18s. So he'll get you 35 disposals a game. But again, uses it so beautifully. Just racks it up at will around the ground. He can win his own ball through the midfield as well. Um, but he is that light type. Where he's only 69 kilos. So I think realistically he's going to settle on the outside. So And he's that small and mid. He's about a 180 thereabouts. So um, yeah, needless to say, I'm a fan. Arlo Draper. It, it's probably been... 
a long-awaited sort of, I guess, debut in my top 20 rankings, but um, yeah, he's been deserving. So coming into the year, I had him around that sort of, let's call it 15 mark. As others rose on my board, he dropped a little bit, but um, yeah, look, I'm comfortable moving him back sort of into that top 15 now, honestly, where he's got the attributes. So he's a good height. He's about, I'd imagine, a 189 without checking in front of me, but he's got the contested components. Um, so he's very good through the midfield. Good athlete. You can play him forward as well. Strong mark. It's the scoreboards. So you've got enough attributes there where look, he's a developable piece. So um, yeah, I'd be pretty comfortable having him in this range. And again, it's just a case of in each of these ranges, I'd like to be even more complimentary than I am. But this is just a below average draft. So um, it is what it is. And not every draft is going to be a super draft. So yeah. Um, yeah. Um, from there, Joshua Brown. So a bit like with the Hugh Jackson in SA, well, Brown's been doing pretty well the equivalent in the um, Waffle Colts. So just absolutely racking it up. He's not quite the user of a Jackson, but um, it, it, certainly in terms of accumulation, he's more that contested ball winning style. Um, but yeah, just racks it up. Absolutely at will. Very aggressive player. So um, yeah, really like the look of him. Um, and probably for me of the um, WA prospects, he's the more solid of the midfielders, I would say, where he just gets it done every week. Um, Matthew Johnson, tall mid, has attributes, but hasn't sort of lived up to the level of expectation I had of him coming into the year. So um, he's been gradually dropping. I hope I don't have to drop him further, but um, yeah, he just needs more consistently strong games ultimately. And then... Um, yeah, then I can sort of justify having him higher rather than lower. Um, Neil Erasmus, he's been really good this year. Racking it up through the midfield, being really consistent, can play sort of inside-outside, you can push him forward, you can hit the scoreboard. Um, unusually gifted reader of the ball, and he's been intercepting at will sort of across half-forward on a wing. Um, so that's sort of a bit unusual to watch. But um, yeah, it's just his kicking lets him down. So if I was more confident in his kicking, I'd probably have him a bit higher. Um, but I think it's about the right spot for him at this point. Ned Long, I haven't seen him recently, but I saw him earlier in the year, and look, he was pretty reasonable. So probably a lower impact than I was hoping from him, but look, he's that tall midfielder, that 190 plus, where strong contested ball winner, so he's good through the midfield, but then he can also push forward, and he's been good for, I think it's even above two goals a game, pushing forward, so... Um, yeah, look, doing that, I think it sort of justifies having him there. Not sure whether others will necessarily have him this high, but he's one where, I guess, when I next sort of see him, maybe my evaluation changes, since I haven't sort of seen as much of him as I've seen of others. But, um, yeah, I'll have to wait and see there. Josh Fahey, really good in um, the um, AFL Academy against Geelong VFL match. Um He's also played a bit of um, VFL for GWS and been reasonable there too in some of those games. So just getting a little bit of a taste there. Um, but yeah, for me, he's probably one of the better sort of rebounding defenders. He's that kick-out specialist, absolute super boot. So um, yeah, there's definitely that role-playing potential, which is why I'm pretty comfortable having him sort of in this range here on my board. And then Mac Andrew. So we'll have to see, will Melbourne be able even to match bids on him, where if a bid comes in the top 20, well, with the new Next Gen Academy rules, they don't have the capability to match him. So, um, but at this stage, very skinny. He'd only be probably, even though it's two metres, he might only be 70 kilos. So, um, needs a lot of time to develop, but, um, and look, I don't love him as a key position player. He'll start his career as a key position player as he develops physically, but um, once he's developed physically, look, as long as he maintains that leap, the mobility, um, the ground level crafts, he's got real potential. So um, just through the ruck, seeing his leap, soft hands, um, I think he could be really good. Has the ground level craft, good skills, so I like him. But again, it has to be through the ruck. Key position, I'm not convinced. Josh Goda, good piece. Probably unlucky not to be in my top 20. Probably a lot of people would have him in their top 20s at this point, I'd imagine, but... Yeah, good athlete, strong mark, has some versatility, can win his own ball, so... Um, and he's been pretty influential, actually, in quite a few of the games I've seen, so... Um, yeah, look, he's one I'd be pretty comfortable with. I could pretty easily argue I could move him into this group, so... Um, and a lot of people, I'm sure, who have seen him would probably argue the same, so... 
Um, he's one where maybe next month I move him up, but for me is just on the edge at this stage, just because I like a few of these guys in this range. But um, if a few don't really go all that well over the coming month or so and go to keeps up his good form, well then he probably replaces them as that most likely candidate at this stage. Jack Williams, good key forward. Um, some people have him in their top 20, I did, in my previous month's power rankings, but I've really had to move him down just sort of thinking about his game. So um, he's got some Tom Hawkins-esque vibes, not the dominant player Hawkins is, but roughly the equivalent of a Hawkins in the Waffle Colts at least. So um, look, strong mark, really good one-on-one, -on -one, uses his body in an incredible way. Um, and whenever there's a ball up, boundary throw in, a bit like a Hawkins, he'll just grab the ball out of the ruck, kick a goal. So, um, really good there, but whether he's athletic enough to justify a first round pick, I think they're the questions that'll come up closer to the draft and probably kick him down more likely into the second, maybe even third round for all I know. But um, he's probably the key forward after a Darcy where I'd be thinking he's probably that next guy I'd want. And if it's a second round pick I can get him with, I'd be reasonably comfortable doing so. But um, yeah, with these key position players, look, there's no certainty um, when you're getting into sort of this far down the boards. So, And I'm not at all impressed with the key positioners this year where you've got Darcy where he's got sky-high potential. He's that real upside key positioner where he could be anything ultimately at that height, developing at the rate he is with his attributes. Um, Mac Andrew, again, is that only other tall in the top 20. So it really speaks to... The lack of quality in the top 20 this year, ultimately in terms of the tools at least, so, and how speculative they are. Um, Jacob Van Royen, so he's been playing key forward, but I'd actually really like to see him moved into defence, where he reads it really well, really good aerial mark, so for me that translates perfectly to defence, so um, I'd love to see that move during the champs, just maybe for a, even if it's a two or three game stretch, just to see if he can. Um, because I think that would be his position. As a key forward, not sure he's quite on the level I'd like, so um, that's why he is where he is ultimately, until he proves that he's got that other end to him. Um, Josh Gibkes, so key defender, probably the best key defender at this stage in the draft. Um, early in the season, I was liking his um, the, both the way he was reading it, but then also taking his intercept marks, so they were really positive components. Um, I haven't liked him in recent weeks where he's been asked to play forward. He's not a forward, doesn't have those capabilities, looks lost there ultimately. Um, in defence, look, I think there's, uh, at least at AFL level, I think if I'm looking at his profile, there's about a 195 centimetre, good athlete, aerial athlete, mobile enough, strong enough. Um, so look, he can be a key defender at the next level. I don't think he'll be a high level one though. Where I'm just thinking about what elite key defenders are at the next level, and I'm not sure I see a Gibkiss reaching that level. And I'm hearing a lot of people have him first round, some even have him top 10. I'm not seeing enough to his game, where there's not enough ways he impacts games. The only way he's really impacting games is with his intercept marking, I'm finding. And look, he can tackle, so that's something that, um, yeah, I'd just like to see a bit more to his game. And if he's going to be used in defense, which he has to, I'd, again, I'd like to see even higher frequency of those intercept marks to really get behind him as a prospect. Because even with key defenders, like you're going to have 200 centimeter key defenders and possibly even more talented ones at that. So um, yeah, to justify going early, even as a key defender, you really have to be top end for me these days. And with the likes of Williams, Van Royen, Gibkiss, for me, I, I still feel this somewhat speculative. So I can't, with that conviction, say I would use such a high pick on them. So um, if these guys go first round, well, that's fine because I wouldn't be taking that high. So it's only in the second round would I be comfortable with any of them. Um, Judson Clark, really impressive actually in the last few weeks. So um, last week, just generating a lot of drive around the ground. And he's one of the more skilled players in the draft. So he's got that in his sort of arsenal as well. And then the week before, of course, well, he was playing in the um, Victorian trial match and he kicked five goals. So he was really that star I guess, small forward there, where he's really going to be that, I guess, just about premier small forward in this draft, where of course you've got Rochelle, but I guess more as that, I guess, speedy ground level type, Clark is more that guy. So if you're after that sort of small crumbing forward, um, bookmark his name, because for me, he's probably that best in this pool. 
Um, Toby Conway, other than Mac Andrew, I think is that best ruck prospect and is probably that most advanced, I'd say, where physically much more advanced than an Andrew, much stronger. Um, in the ruck, he'll often just win the ball out of the ruck and get the clearance himself. So that's sort of what his game looks like. Um, it'd be good to see him do a few more things around the ground, impact games a few more ways. But um, look, if there's sort of a ruckman that you want around the mid-draft point, well, Conway is the one I'd be pretty comfortable in sort of saying he's the guy in this draft. Um, Jack Avery, he's an overager, but he's one where I'm really comfortable with him, and I'd pick him any day of the week. So, um, yeah, he's one where he didn't put his name in for the mid-season draft, but, yeah, he's just a really good defender. So um, I'd be looking out for him at the end of the year as someone where he deserves to go national draft, whether he will or not, we'll have to see, but he was dominating in the Waffle Colts, so he was averaging... Something silly, like it was 30 plus disposals. He was having 35 disposal games in the Waffle Colts in defense and just intercepting everything, high usage player back there. Um, but he can also shut down opponents. So he's a multifaceted defender. Um, and now he's moved up, of course, to Waffle League level. And again, he's fitting in at that level, having no problems. So, And he's looking better with each passing game. So um, he's one where I'd be very comfortable picking him. Had he been nominated in the mid-season draft, he would have been one of my first few picks. So, um, yeah, he's one where I can't imagine others would have him this high on their boards. Um, if they do, I'll claim that's good talent ID. But, um, yeah, he's one where certainly I'm very comfortable having him there. And then an Angus Baker. So he's one where he entered the mid-season draft, but he wasn't picked. So mature age, uh, he was great in the NEFL for a number of years there. Um, if I want an immediate general defender who can just fit in and be that rebounder and a scepter, Baker's the guy. So um, he's good for... He's been 20 disposals plus every game in the BFL this year. So um, he's that really good sort of rebounder and interceptor at that level. And I, I think he has the game where he can push up to AFL level and just be that lock and load, plug and play guy. So um, yeah, if you want that, he's the guy for that. Um, the next names I'll just move over quickly, but a few quick points here. The only Victorians I have... So Conway is really, I guess, the last Victorian from the under-18s that I've got here. And then you've got Wilmot as well. But from here on in, it's really just Wilmot and then I've got um, Pescard, where... Oh, sorry, not Pescard, Lambert, rather. So Lambert in the VFL. They're the only Victorians I've got from this point onwards. And there's not really the quality in Victoria this year. So um, they've had their, I guess, delayed pre-seasons where that's been moved back. They've had their breaks during the season, but they've also had their coaches shared with the girls. So um, ultimately, look, it has really impacted on the development of these guys. And of course, last year was a write-off. So, um, and what you'll find with a lot of the Victorian prospects, and this is probably going a bit off topic from my power rankings for the moment here, but um, what I would be saying is, it's more, I guess, the private school boys that are still able to get that sort of training and advice that probably those at, for the local clubs probably can't to the same extent. Um, so that's sort of the advantage there. So, um, and that's why with guys like, whether it's a day cost, whether it's a McDonald, I could go on through all the private school boys. But that's why a lot of the better names are from the private schools. So... And I think we'll probably see over the coming years more and more of the Victorians even at higher rates than we have in recent years, really be those private school boys because they are able to keep getting that sort of, I guess, coaching when I guess the NAB League clubs can't provide the coaching to the extents that they have in the past. So, um, but yeah, to just go through the last names quickly. So Wilmot, good piece. Um, Butler, same. Maybe they push towards the first round. We'll have to wait and see. Rayson has been good in um, SA. Stag, same. He's been good in SA, playing really good footy there. Um, Lambert, if you want a ready-to-go small forward, he's the guy there. Um, he's been really good in the VFL, so he's that second mature ager other than Baker that I'd be recommending. Um, I've next gone with, um, actually, as it happens, three academy guys, but they're also all over ages, so they're all eligible last year. Frost has been dominant in the um, NAB League, where... Just every game is played is led GWS in defence, in disposals. I think Marks as well, even. So, um, yeah, he's killing it there. Looking decent in the VFL. And Pescat and Crozier. So they've both played VFL this year, and they both look good at that level. So 
Um, Pescad last year was a really good forward. He's pushing up more onto a wing, up the field more this year, looking really good. Crozier, yeah, he was more that outside type. This year he's starting to win more of his own balls. So, um, yeah, given that, um, yeah, look, these are guys that I would be watching and I would be very comfortable drafting, whether it's... And look, I'd say you can probably get them as rookies. Maybe Frost, maybe not. But um, Pescott and Crozier, I haven't heard any talk about them this year. So um, if I wanted them, I'd pick them up as rookies happily and be pretty comfortable there. there. Uh, next one. So again, I've gone three South Australians here. And then I've gone a miss from um, WA. So and he's been killing in terms of accuracy in front of goal is that... I guess, tall athletic forwards. So, um, yeah, so they're the names. Um, and for a few things I'd like to go into quickly, and of course with any of these players, if you want more details about their games, let me know. For the top 20, as I've mentioned already, um, in my July power rankings on espn.com.au slash AFL, you can get complete strengths and weaknesses for all these players, player comparisons, um, rationale as to why I've put them where I have in even greater detail than... I've gone into this video, so um, if you enjoy this video, then make sure you check that out if you really want to learn more about these draft prospects. But some points of interest I thought I'd mention. So, um, so the breakdown by state, and this is why in the title of this video I'm expressing concern about the Victorian prospects. So I'm located in Victoria, um, I watch the Victorians every week they're playing other than when they have the breaks, in which case I'm tuning into the Sandful website and really watching as much Sandful footy as I can. But in looking through state by state at the breakdown, so out of the 40, less than half of them Victoria. And you've got Lambert from the VFL. So um, that's really concerning. If you look back at drafts past, well, just the NAB League or TAC Cup of old, that makes up more than half of the draft every year, without exception in recent history, I don't know going way back into the 90s, but certainly in the last 20 years, more than half of every draft is from the NAB League slash TAC Cup, so, um, and certainly from Victoria. So, um, seeing that number below 50% is gravely concerning. I know through that last 10, most are interstaters or outside Victorian prospects, but nevertheless, that is really something where and this was not intentional in putting this board together, but there's just a lot less Victorians that I'm comfortable with in any part of the draft, for that matter, than I normally would be. Where, whether I'm looking up the top end, well, I'm not seeing the star Victorians I would ordinarily, and then I'm not seeing the depth of Victorian talent either. Um, look, there's some overages I could say from Victoria where I like them, but of draft age, I'm not all that enthused by Victoria's talent this year for the, men the reasons already mentioned. So I'm um, looking at the breakdowns. So you've got basically half the South Australians as you do from Victoria. So um, by South Australian standards, that's an incredible result if they manage that. And seven WA players from the first 40, well, again, they would be ecstatic in um, Western Australia hearing those numbers. So, um, and that's not intended. I didn't mean to have that many from those states, but it just so happens that Victoria is weaker this year, unfortunately. Um, Queensland 3, New South Wales ACT 3. So again, good results for those states. Um, and then mature ages. So I've got a couple, Baker, Lambert. So um, you've got your New South Wales ACT pick in Baker. You've got Lambert there as a Victorian representing. And then here in the overages, again, you've got the interstaters really that uh, the ones that are quite impressive. So Avery from WA, you've got a couple of Queenslanders, and again, you've got your New South Wales ACT pick in Frost. So, um, yeah, look, given that, it's interesting, I would say. And not something that I would be expecting in a normal year. And my suspicion is, given, I guess, if this continues, where you're going to have in Victoria the... Um, the coaches of both the boys also coaching the girls and for the boys pre-seasons to start later, for them not really to be able to do their camps or anything like that. Well, if the funding, the resources, the time and development spent on the Victorians declines, well, that's really going to gravely impact on the quality of the draft pools. And basically based on, I guess, the lack of quality from Victoria, and the other states are roughly doing what they would in a normal year, roughly. But 
I'm um, not seeing that development from the Victorians and it, it's even more obvious by the state of the key positioners in Victoria where um, if I'm to go through which key position players from Victoria are good, well, who are the tools that make it? Well, you've got Darcy, who is that sort of later developer, but then from there it's just Andrew, and then you've got Gibkiss. So um, that's not particularly great. Conway is the ruck, sure. Um, but yeah, that's all you've got in terms of tolls from Victoria. So that's another indication right there to me that immediately sticks out that these guys aren't getting the development they need to get to the level we're accustomed to from Victoria. And um, yeah, I think as a result, the drafts will suffer in the coming years. And um, we'll also see the clubs really relying on the draft and really investing heavily into the draft really impacted and not necessarily getting the outcomes that they're accustomed to. So um, they're things that I really wanted to bring to people's attentions and alert you to in advance because it's not the best sort of situation to be in. Thanks for watching guys and if you enjoyed this video make sure you give it a like, subscribe and hit the notification bell for future updates and um, yeah in my next video I'm looking to look at I guess in the last 20 years the greatest teams so obviously the great dynasties we've had so we've had Brisbane we've had Geelong Hawthorne and then Richmond so looking at the best I guess four year spans of each of those teams I'm going to really look at well which of those teams is the greatest so um, yeah that's something to look forward to next week um, and something that I'll thoroughly enjoy going through because as a Collingwood supporter I've got no bias towards any of those teams and um, yeah, we've got thoroughly beaten, it's fair to say, by all of them during those times. So, um, yeah. But, um, yeah, and I'd also mention apologies for not connecting my mic for the main part of the video. But as I'm sure you can understand, after recording for 35 minutes, I just didn't want to record it again. Um, so, apologies there. So, hopefully next week I remember. But, um, yeah, it won't be the first or the last time that I'll forget to do that. So, apologies in advance for all those times in the future. But... Anyway, see you guys in the next video.